No, the hum is gone. Okay, so I have my mic open. So, okay, I don't. Could be my phone. It's rather close to the to the mic. Okay, thanks. We are waiting a bit more to get to the usual number of uh, attendees uh, that we see. Uh, we are right now at 10 attendees, and hopefully that will increase soon. And we will get started soon.
Okay, it's five minutes after, and and it seems we have lost lost one uh, one warrior along the way. Uh, we are at nine attendees right now. Uh, quite a few of the usual attendees are not shown are not shown up yet. Uh, I got a mail from Yi saying that he. <clears throat> the same time. Okay, uh, you broke up, but I heard that he's going to join when he can. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we can wait a little bit more or get started. I think... Uh, uh, I think we should get going. It's, yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So welcome uh, to MPLS Network Action Interim Meeting, uh, part of the series of uh, open calls that we're having every week. Um, this is a, an, a collaborative work between three working groups, MPLS PALS and DETNET. Um, we are presenting the note well because this is an official interim meeting and uh, please get uh, acquainted with this note. Uh, it uh, covers the rules and uh, regulations of contributions to IETF. Do you, some useful uh, pointers there uh, in case you needed them, uh, you can find them on this uh, slide. So right on to the discussion today, we, uh, we have uh, four items and uh, the last usual item is an open um, item for anyone to add to the agenda. So I will stop and please go through the agenda and let me know if you have any concern. Okay. All right. So we will go through the agenda uh, to the first item, which is reviewing the action items that we're tracking. Uh, we have two open items, uh, action items uh, uh, that are still open. Um, the first one is to continue the investigation on the intersection of MNA with existing MPLS features. Last week, we had a <clears throat> discussion on DETNET uh, with MNA uh, or DETNET with, um, yeah, um, with MNA, uh, and that was given by Greg. So uh, um, hopefully, there will be similar investigation with other features that uh, MPLS supports. Um, it's an open item, and feel free if anyone ha has anything to update it now. Uh, by the way, the the slides that Greg has shared with us last week are uploaded on the Action Items uh, Wiki. And uh, I don't know if I... Probably I'll leave it in the notes. Uh, okay. Best way is to put it on the uh, note takers uh, wiki. So let me do that while I'm presenting. Um, we are taking notes today for the minutes uh, on this wiki. So please uh, consider helping um, out in uh, taking the minutes. You should have received a, uh, a text note in the chat. Okay, so the second action All right. item that... We... All right. Sorry. Two in the queue. Yes, yes. Two. Oh, the lower okay. person. Yeah, we, I see two, uh, two people in the queue and Loa is at the top. Go ahead. Uh, kind of a question. I don't know where who should actually answer it. We did a presentation of... Uh, Deathnet and MA last week. 
my question is, should we do something similar for beer? And do we have someone that actually can present, or do we just send an invite to the beer shares? I think this is a good question. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to see a similar presentation, but uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, anyone on the call that, you know, or maybe, like you said, Greg, we can Greg, reach out. Greg is behind me in the queue and probably is going to answer that. So why don't you Greg, go to Greg? Okay, so let's move on to Stewart and then to Greg. Um, anything else, Lua? No, I'm okay. I just want to have the question noted so we take care of it when we can. Uh, okay, let me open an action item for that. Greg, I think you should go, Greg, I think you should go before me because I think you're probably going to answer to the same point, talk to the point um, Tarek was just talking to. Um, yes, um, actually, I, I've done some work. Uh, I've done work on um, beer, and uh, if uh, beer chairs would agree, uh, I would be glad to make a presentation on uh, beer in MPLS, how it's uh, encoded, what's there, and uh, what's expected. Um, so. Uh, Time-wise, probably that would be after ITF meeting, if that's okay. Okay, I took that down. Uh, thank you, Greg. So, so, so mine was just a, uh, a, a an FYI um, um, question. You said that the slides are archived in the MPLS wiki area. Um, aren't they archived automatically as part of the? Um, uh, the fact that this is an interim meeting, don't they go into a bundle associated with each in interim meeting? Uh, that's a good question, Stuart. I think the material that we upload uh, is saved. Um, uh, that's my feeling. I can double check that. But the slides, uh, Greg, uh, at that time uh, did not upload them. So we'll have to see a way to upload them. So it, uh, the slides were presented during the session uh we'll have to see if we can upload them after the interim has passed uh but okay, that's I, a good yeah. that is the way it's supposed to work sorry i interrupted someone yeah that makes sense Stuart. thanks uh loa you're back uh, so two questions first uploading slides if we can't do it ourselves, we can always ask the Secretariat to do it for us, so that we can solve that. Uh, the second one, on timing for a beer presentation. Yeah, after uh, ITF 117, it's okay for me, and I think that we can do it like that. Okay. All right, and the uh, next uh, action item that we have uh, and we're tracking is the updates that we need to do to MNA working group draft documents. And uh, basically, if there's, um, you know, there were multiple discussions uh, about multiple ISDs in the packet and so on, and we're mm, um, there were things that uh, that were not clearly spelled out in the requirements to a draft. So there was an action item to, for the authors to uh, validate at least this is covered. Um, so last week, I did promise to send a summary of the discussion uh, to the working group mailing list. I have not yet, um, and I'm willing to do that uh, this week or maybe towards the end of this week. Um, if it is useful, but if any of the authors have done any updates, let, it, let us know and I will note it down. <clears throat> okay, I'm not looking at the queue all the time, uh, but I don't, okay, I just looked and nobody, uh, 
uh, has any updates. Stuart, do you want to say something? No, no, no. I, I just put up, put the microphone on so that I could tell you if someone was trying to get in the uh, in, in the queue because it's hard for you to see it. I think. Okay. All right. Uh, these are the action items that I am tracking, and uh, we possibly have a new one today uh, for the beer presentation. Um, so I'll move on to the next item on the, today's agenda. Um, so I do have a slide coming up on uh, a part of this uh, set of slides. Uh, but, and I need to switch to uh, uh, a different set of slides for Steward. I'm OK to go through this. Uh, do you mind if we continue um, you know, to item four and then go back to item three? Uh, As Steward? you see fit. As you see fit. OK. Sorry, yeah, I, I should have noted uh, the shuffling before the meeting. OK, so this is one slide um, I composed. I was uh, discussing with, uh, with Loa. <clears throat> and we have some open questions on m and and uh, I want to make sure that uh, at least we are all aware of them. And uh, not necessarily the answers, but the questions are there. Uh, so usually the, if the flow of MPLS packets, a single flow, will have the same, uh, you know, packets will have the same label stack and LSRs will use that label stack, some of them at least, uh, classically would use the label stack to hash onto uh, ECMPs. Um, with m and ISD, it's possible that um, <clears throat> a LSR may modify the MPLS stack for different packets of the same flow. Um, so this will this can have impact on these classic routers if they continue to hash on the full stack. Um, the first, you know, I had open questions like I uh, mentioned, which of the following could be true? m &A header mandates getting entropy label as a network action and all m and capable LSRs must hash or process on the entropy label um, as opposed on the full stack. So that could be a true or a false statement. Um, um, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open to pausing and uh, seeking, uh, you know, opinions. And I can continue the whole slide and then you know, people can, uh, can ask questions or uh, sound opinions at the end. So my feeling is uh, let me continue and uh, see what happens towards the end. So the second statement is m and packet must only traverse m and capable LSRs. Uh, this way, if the m and packet carries an entropy label, then we can mandate that, or then the, 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 the flow of packets will, uh, will flow over the same ECMP. Um, <clears throat> The other alternative is uh, um, the third statement is m and packets carry the, the usual, uh, the classic ELI EL uh, along with m and header. Um, that was discussed in the past and that uh, can have an implication on the size of the label stack, but it has an advantage that uh, non m and capable uh, LSRs can still hash on the entropy. So with the first two statements, only m and capable LSRs can do that. And the last statement is, uh, is, <clears throat> is interesting, is any mutable m and data should not reside in the ISD. Uh, so th these are four points there. And then uh, the, the path selection, uh, when we're selecting a path for a m and packet, we talked about the, uh, the the ingress or maybe whoever is setting up the path, selecting a path uh, of uh, nodes that are m and capable. Uh, but is it desirable that we traverse non m and capable LSRs as well? For example, to cover brownfield deployments. And the last statement is, you know, we know that even if we select the primary path to be all MNA capable, 
during transient network conditions, some MA packets may be detoured or rerouted. Uh, and how do we ensure that after uh, such transient conditions, the, the packets continue to be forwarded by MNA capable LSRs? Okay, so we, we go to the queue now, and Stuart is at the top. So um, I think point three is related to um, uh, bullet three, bullet one, as it were. Uh, there's no numbers on them, right? So I, I, I think it's unreasonable to suppose that this only goes into a pure new um, new build, and thus um, you have to have uh, non-entropy processing um, packets in the system, and you probably have to have non-EL capable routers in the um, in the system which I think means that uh, bullet three has to be of the form that all LSRs on the path use EL for ECMP, if that is what you want to do. But I think three will be a problem for a lot of um, deployed the deployed base. Yeah, but okay, that, that I understand. And, and the challenge is, like you said, uh, some LSRs don't support ELI today, uh, right? Okay, Tony, you're next. Hi. So my read of this is slightly different, and so I'm going to say five, none of the above. Um, there, the situation is way more complicated than you make it out to be. And there are many variables which are orthogonal, which you have not described very clearly. So let me take a stab at doing this in a logical way. Um, first of all, the question is whether EL is uh, necessary whatsoever. Uh, obviously, if ECMP is not used on the path, EL is not required. And so that right. becomes irrelevant. Uh, assuming EL is is required, then the question becomes, is EL useful at every hop? It's very, very likely that ECMP is not used at every hop. If it is only used at uh, hops that support MNA, then you can put EL in the MNA header and you are just fine. If you're using ECMP at a non-MNA capable node, then you should use traditional ELI. Um, can, if you can, are... can I pause, Tony? I know uh, you're you're trying to re rebuke um, all the points, but can we stop at one point because I need clarity? Please. Okay, so you're saying that we're fine if we carry the entropy label in the MNA action, right? That 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 statement I heard just now. Because we're not fine if the LSR is not MNA capable at all. If you have an MNA capable, if all of the nodes that need EL are MNA capable, then put EL in the MNA header. Right? Not every but node. But then the, the last point, the last point, then which you know transient conditions might take you on a non-MNA capable path. Are you are you sure that it's always going to be? Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, so my my understanding, at least of MPLS, is that if you have a transient condition, and your path is changing, then your label stack is probably also changing. Mm, can I answer that? Please. Okay, it will change, uh, you know, like the PLR might impose additional labels, but that will be uh, for all packets of the same flow. So it's so they will, they will basically have all the same uh, label stack. Okay, but if so if the PLR is yeah. gonna add more labels, then it has to make the same decision about whether it's going to add EL or not. Right, it, the PLR knows about the subsequent path. Mm, EL is cho is chosen at the ingress, not PLR. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that if you do it the other way around, that implies every packet needs EL. Yeah. In case every, of, every MNA packet needs that. No, uh, every yeah. packet. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, the classical way of of LSR is using the label stack is non desirable, but it's still there in the, in uh, deployments, right? Well, that's suboptimal in my view. I, I would not want EL present if there's no ECMP on the primary path. Okay. Anything okay. else, Tony? So now, if you do use MNA with EL, then there is a mutable portion of the label. And we've, in the ISD document, we are pretty clear. And it says that the mutable portion should not be in the first 20 bits. So anybody who wants to hash on MNA, even if they are not MNA capable, should not be disturbed by mutability outside of the label. Mm. Okay. That, that's interesting proposal there. Uh, um, we'll have to see if uh, that can be respected by all LSRs. Okay. It, it, Anything is this documented in the in the the, the draft, uh, Tony? Okay, I guess uh, Tony's uh, muted now. Uh, I think so. However, apparently, it's not sufficiently clear. So the editors might want to consider modifying the document to improve it. That is a huge constraint. Okay, I'm sorry, sir, uh, you broke up. Can you say again. That is a huge, sorry, sorry, Greg, for going in front of you. That is a huge constraint, though, Tony, isn't it? That means that you can't send more than 20 contiguous bits as uh, MNA data, as ISD. Uh, unless they're fixed, right? You can't have any You're, 20 bits. You, you have an enormous amount of noise co covering you, Stuart, and I think I heard you say that you can't send more than 20 bits. Um, it's the question is what's mutable on the path. And if you're sending, trying to send lots of mutable data on path, then you need multiple LSE entries. Uh, and you want to do that? That's fine with me. Go right ahead. Okay, Greg, you're next. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have a question about uh, number two, uh, because uh, what's a um, what's the scenario is envisioned that MNA is at top of the stack, or MNA is present in the stack? Yeah, oh, I can try to answer that. So. There are two cases indeed. Uh, then the action is edge to edge, and and then the uh, the MNA header is exposed at the edge, uh, at you know the, at the egress. And there are hop by hop actions, and in that case, the MNA header may not be at the top. So then the indicator will have to be, you know, understood by LSRs. So. I think yeah. I, I meant both cases in, in, in the discussion here. Um, the hop by hop action is more relevant. Well, because uh, as I understand, what we are uh, trying to convey is that uh, when edge is uh, or some system uh, constructs their label stack with MNA, uh, so it's 
should uh, should ensure that M and A uh, will be uh, accessible only to capable M and A capable uh, LSRs. So I think that would be different from their statement two, because statement two says that uh, any non um, MNA capable LSR must not be traversed by uh, MPLS packet um, with the stack that uh, contains MNA. So right. uh, if, LSR, if LSR is not MNA capable, but uh, is not really, uh, MNA is not at the top, then uh, I don't see why it, it has to be so restrictive. I see. So I think, uh, yeah, I need to clarify, uh, you know, if we have a hop by hop action and we're traversing multiple LSRs, the expectation is each LSR will process the m &E packet. Uh, well, again, that is, depends on the action because uh, I would say, for example, uh, IOM. Uh, it's uh, if it's uh, supported in ISD, then it's useful, but it's not mandatory. So uh, we'll collect information from those nodes that are capable of supporting MNA um, IAM, but uh, if not, that does not affect uh, anything else. So uh, again, so what you're uh, is point four. Then I think what you're hinting to is mutable data should not be in the stack, and and, and this and basically we don't have a problem of uh, uh, the stack changing for uh, packet many packets, right? I think that's what you're hinting to is. Uh, we don't want to change the label stack uh, on the floor. Well, I, I, I think it's, as Tony pointed out, uh, the real picture would probably would be much more complex than this uh, statement. So it's, it's, again, at this time, at this point, uh, I cannot really uh, answer uh, the questions yes or no. Uh, the only okay. thing that I would say, it depends. It depends. Okay. All right. The, the, the point of triggering these questions is uh, there is no clear answer. So if this produces uh, clarity, then the objective is reached. And uh, the, not after, you know, immediate answer for true or false, but if there is some clarity somewhere, it would be useful. So Joel, you're at the top of the queue. Go ahead. Okay. I you you dealt a little bit with one of the important points. We need to be very clear when we are talking about MNA hop by hop actions, and when we are talking about selective or end to end actions, because the implications on intermediate processing nodes are different. Node if the selective is not just under the top label, nobody else cares. It doesn't matter if they don't plot process it. With hop by hop, if it's in the visible region, you're expected to look at it. We need to be clear and consistent about this. It's why I wrote so many words in my emails about pushing things. It was a pain, but you got, we got to be clear about it. Um, I consider that if we require that all nodes be in the network be upgraded, M&A Sticky and FFRR. Well, you know those paths have those packets have already taken a different path from the packets that didn't get rerouted, and the fact that the label stack may be different because of that is probably not a fatal issue. Whereas packets that are expected to be taking the same path, you start messing with the label stack. It's at least a more nuanced question. 
And in some of the comments, people said, well, you should know whether the, e the ECMP is being applied or whether all the nodes are MNA capable unless we assume that all paths are strict, which I sure hope we don't require, then you can't know that because you will be going through routers that will be looking at their label table and making decisions and routing may change there and may send them through different routers. And it does not seem to me to be a knowable state to make dependency on knowing the properties of all the routers on the path. You can know for selective whether the things you are selecting can do MA. And for things which you are addressing, you can know whether they're a, they can do MA. But we're not, a, I at least don't assume that we're doing strict paths because that seems excessive. And this whole thing is an example of why I, detailed write ups are much more useful than one slide. I get tired enough of Erickson trying to answer, to ask complicated questions in slides. Words are a big help. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Stewart. Hear me again. Um, so I'd like to suggest a, 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 an algorithm that would probably work, and that's that uh, if there is changeable uh, data in the packet, then if each node on the path is MNA capable, you can uh, you do not need an ELI you could have uh, ECMP information inside the uh, MNA uh, portion otherwise in other words you are not sure that every hop that the packet will go through is MNA capable you must include the EL stroke ELI in order to ensure the path um, I don't think it depends on whether this is end-to-end -end or hop by hop Joel I think it depends on whether you have um, changeable data, not uh, because um, uh, nodes that do not understand MNA will be trying to make their ECMP decision. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, my, that's how I would summarize it. You have, if, if you are not sure, you put an ELI in there. If you are sure, you don't have to. I, I yeah, acknowledge. Okay. Tony? Wow. Okay. Um, Let's see, let's start with talking about MMA capability. Uh, so I, where I thought we left off, um, we had several cases we have to worry about. Uh, there are legacy nodes who may barf when they see the MNA label at all. Um, and if you have legacy nodes like that, then you cannot deploy MNA on that path. There's just no way to do it. Um, there may be legacy nodes that see the MNA label and ignore it, and that's fine um, as long as you don't need MNA actions to happen at that node. That's not an issue. Um, obviously, if you have such a node and you need that node to do ECMP, uh, MNA EL will not work, and you need traditional ELI. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. OK. All right, Rakesh. <clears throat> uh, hi. So um, just one small point about uh, using the label stack for the CMP. Um, so if we are using in-stack ancillary data, uh, we have repurposed TC and TTL fields. So there are bits there, uh, 3 plus 8. Um, 11 bits that can be muted um, uh, without impacting the ECMP if there is a need to uh, uh, have something in ISD that changes without affecting ECMP. Thanks. Okay. So so I think there is a lot of feedback coming in and uh, some of it is clear, some of it is needs more discussion. I am just wondering if... Um, um, if we need to elaborate in the documents or clarify further uh, these points. Uh, some of them we're saying that we need to take action on. Uh, 
So maybe I can track this with an, uh, yeah, um, I would like to hear more feedback on that uh, front. Rakesh, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, the documenting this, uh, what I mentioned, is in the ISD solution draft already. Thanks. Yeah, I meant, uh, you know, at least addressing all the concerns on the slide. I am not sure if your proposal covers everything. For example, some, uh, some LSRs would be hashing on the full label stack. Uh, so how do you address that? Okay, Tony. That's all the point that yes. if it has it on the full label stack, uh, you could use mutable data into repurpose these CTTL fields without affecting ECMP. I don't understand that. The labels, like so there are the 32 bits of LSE has 20 bits of labels, and uh, other ones are the CTTL. So hashing happens on the 20 bits of the labels, right? So. It doesn't use the TTLTC fields for hashing. So if you are changing bits, for example, um, next for uh, fast read out or alternate marking or what are the other purpose, um, mm. it will not affect ACMP. That's what's... Okay, no, I meant if you're carrying timestamps, for example, you're not going to carry them in the inter in the 20 bits timestamps. Okay. Well, so we have the eight plus three bits available, uh, 11 bits available if you want to use in ISD in one LSE. So if you need to use more than that, you need to use two LSEs in ISD. But I'm just saying that there is some something available if there is a use case for it. Okay. Thank you. There, there can be nodes that are hashing on the full stack, in which case you basically have no mutable data. But I mean, that's a local problem. In any case, to, to process, um, the ISD document is now a working group document. If people have clear, clear objections or you know, clarifications, I strongly suggest that the way to address them is to propose additional text on the mailing list. Talking about these que complicated questions with no preparation in this meeting has led to a great deal of confusion. Um, it would be very, very helpful to have a more considered um, discussion on the mailing list so that we can make progress. OK. Um, I still would like to see, I mean, I'm, I'm, what you're saying is um, maybe we should have a discussion on the mailing list, and I, I, uh, I would like uh, that as well. Um, and if we can close all the items, I'm happy. Um, now, but I see you're still raising your hand, so go ahead, Tony. And please, Tarek, have people propose text. Okay. Be very specific. This is complicated. Throwing out bullet points is confusing the issue because it's not sufficiently nuanced. Sure. That's fair point. Okay. Stuart? Um, so what I, I agree with Tony on that last point. And what I was going to propose is that you trigger a discussion on this on the list. Uh, if that is as simple as just republishing this slide as text to start off the discussion, then that's certainly one way of doing it. I think Tony would like to see more text associated with each point. But I, either way, the right thing to do, I think, is to move this discussion to the list. OK. All right. So I don't have anything else besides uh, this slide. And I will stop right here. and. Uh, share the other set, you know, move on to the next item on the agenda today. Uh, let me see if I can find that quickly. Okay. Okay. So uh, the background to this is that uh, we had a fairly extended discussion in a previous meeting where it was asserted. Now you want to go to the next slide, please. 
where it was asserted that once a packet has been fast rerouted uh, past the failure and back onto the normal path, the NFRR flag was no longer needed and could be cleared and, it, and that it was safe after that for further NFR uh, or further fast reroute actions to take place. If I misunderstood, then uh, uh, please, uh, please correct. Now, and I think I remember at the time arguing that uh, the concept of a second failure, uh, attempting a second repair, was contrary to the established fast reroute philosophy, and that it's only safe to repair against the set of postulated failures that the FRR action was calculated for. And if any further uh, failure was observed anywhere in the network, we had to, to use the uh, expression we, we used in the development of it, we had to abandon all hope, cease all fast reroute and reconverge the network using the standard best effort approach. Um, so, and I couldn't remember at the time uh, the exa an example um, um, condition that um, uh, for this. Uh, so go to the next slide. Right, so this is a fragment of a network. Um, it's not a network that, that's fragmented, but it is just, you know, to use the term, the FRR term uh, is a network fragment. So in this fragment, to make life easier, I'm going to have H, which is a multi-home prefix. If people want to rule multi-home prefixes out of scope, I will simply um, um, uh, use prefix A, and I will have some routers that go between the H on the left and the H on the right, and I will almost certainly have more than one routers because we always use more than one router to prevent um, hidden exchanges between adjacent routers, um, which can sometimes be used to sort of uh, bypass complex. Um, um, work around strange events right so i have two a, a, a prefix on the left and a prefix same prefix on the right i have two plrs plr1 and plr2 these are normal routers when they're not preparing um, but i used one common term for them in, in both of them um, modes uh, i'm going to assert that the cost from plr1 to x is equal to the cost from plr2 to z and that the paths um, have multiple nodes to prevent any sort of cheating and collusion, and that all, cost, all costs are uh, one except for the cost between uh, PLR1 and X and PLR2 and Z. Oh, by the way, and all path costs are symmetric, because that's another way of introducing strangenesses to these systems. All right, so this is a really simple um, a network, equal cost between 1 and X, equal cost between 2 and Z, everything else is 1. Next slide, please. Right, so um, we're going to fail uh, PLR1 to H, and we're going to implement fast reroute. If we're going to implement fast reroute, we have to repair to Z. If we were to repair to X, the packet would come back to PLR1, so that wouldn't work. If we repaired to Y, we would get uh, ECMP, so that doesn't work. It could go left or right or, uh, at Y. Um, so we're going to send it to Z. Um, the packet is now back on the normal path, and according to the, um, uh, the hypothesis that, well, that was discussed at an earlier meeting, NFRR is cleared. And in this particular scenario, the packet will successfully proceed to H via PLR2, we're operating as a normal router um, and the uh, and links and nodes between it. Okay, so that's easy. Next slide, please. All right, so this is the exactly the same thing, but the other way around, right? The failure was between PLR2 and H, and the packet got rerouted to X and proceeds on its happy path back via PLR1 to, uh, to H, and that is all fine. Next slide, please. The next slide is obvious uh, because I'm going to take a failure in um, PLR1 to H and PLR2 to H. And to quote the English children's nursery rhyme, here we go around the mulberry bush. Uh, the packet is going to loop until it dies of old age. Um, since uh, neither PLR know about the history of the packet before uh, um, uh, NFRR was cleared, and so it will loop until uh, TTL expires, consuming the bandwidth. Next slide, please. So therefore, uh, NFRR must be sticky, assuming we're going to use NFRR and assuming we're going to try and do multiple failure protection. 
Tony. So H is unreachable. Yeah, but nobody knows that. Can you go, want to go back one, please, Tarek? Nobody knows this at the time. This is FRR, right? Yeah, but H is and unreachable, so it doesn't really much matter. Yes, it does, because um, some packet is going to enter this network somewhere. It's going to try and get to H because it doesn't know H is unreachable yet. And so these packets are going to go bouncing around between the left and the right of the network until they die. And that's not a good thing. Until signaling tears things down. Until um, we go to regular reconversions, yes. Until we reconverge proper, fully reconverge, um, there will be nodes in this network that do not realize those failures have occurred. And that packet will loop around uh, consuming um, its a TTLs with the bandwidth. Now, if uh, we're going to assume that uh, we, we're not going to be sending any packets to H because H is unreachable, then, um, well, we, we, we must have had some method of telling everyone in the node, in, in the network, that that's the case. And um, that's known as, you know, essentially abandon all hope regular reconvergence. Tarek? Um, uh, Stuart, I think what you're highlighting is the uh, NFR, NFFRR flag is relevant beyond the merging point, your Z. Absolutely, it is, yes. So we like to keep it sticky all the way. Uh, you, either have the... to, you either have to keep it sticky um, or you uh, have to abandon all hope on a uh, second failure, regardless of where it is. You see, if um, we kept it sticky, um, what would have happened was PLR1 um, would have sent its packet to Z. From Z, it would have got to PLR2, and it would have died then. And meanwhile, um, some other packet could have easily been repaired um, or some other um, and, and regular productive forwarding could have continued um, for re for ordinary packets until such time as we were going to we could do a controlled reconvergence of the network. Um, but you know, unless you uh, make it sticky, you have to uh, go to your emergency plan when you get a second uh, a, a second failure. Now, I think a sticky NFRR actually is an interesting concept within the sort of um, concept of doing fast reroute and we would have liked it some years ago but we couldn't see how to do it with the data plane technology that people were prepared to deploy then um, and it has all kinds of useful properties but um, what has to happen is it has to be sticky or you will get this sort of meltdown I'm showing in this picture okay thank you No other questions. Do I need to get? Do we need to get this written down somewhere? Because clearly, I'd forgotten it. I couldn't find it in any FRR documents, and others on this call hadn't realised this scenario uh, took place. And this is an absolutely this is a, a FRR one hundred and one situation. Um, we have lower. Go ahead. Uh, well. The answer is kind of obvious we need to write it down somewhere the question is rather where is somewhere so where do we want to put it Joel it next. seems clear to me that the answer to Loa's question is you need a draft that describes the NFFRR action and describes its stickiness and describes exactly how with MNA one would implement said stickiness, including all the corner cases, like you push an NFFRR on a packet that doesn't currently have any MNA or any all of those cases and write them down so we know what is required to do an NFFRR that is sticky. 
and we, why and that draft should include the explanation of why you would want to do so. And then we can make a decision as to is this a cost we're willing to pay? And this, you, you, Stuart, you raise an interesting case here. And it's not your fault. It's not in some other draft already. No, I was thinking actually, Joel, that, that this was at, this actually transcended um, uh, M and A, um, and was interesting in its own um, in its own right because uh, people clearly have forgotten. Uh, um, you, you know that you that, that introducing an NFR flag in some way in some packets, which we've talked about in other cases, um, doesn't work entirely as well as people think it would. I I, so I think I, as a practical really matter, it would, Sorry? I think as a practical matter, Stuart, if we put it in this draft with the explanation, people can still point to it. Just write the explanation so that it's general. That way, we don't have to get into trying to get some other draft through some non-existent working group. Well, no, and, 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 or... the, the, the working group is uh, RTGWG, of course. That's where all the NFR tech, all the FRL technology is um, is hosted. Yeah, but nobody finds things from there. So I, what I'm saying is, we know we have the problem. We know we need to document the problem so we can explain what we need. Going and writing some other draft in some other working group, while possibly technically arguably correct, doesn't give enough advantage. Let's just write one here that proposes, given this problem, therefore, given this goal, don't reroute after failure, there are these extra constraints documented in general, not MA specific. Therefore, for MA, we need to do foo. Seems All right, like well, that I'll... at least get, allows us to make progress on figuring out what we want to do. So, so all right. So, where are we with? A, well, I should let someone else go first. But um, where are we with having a draft I can submit some text to? Uh, okay, I don't have I that. Just, right, should, or, or, or should I just write a draft? Well, I'm reluctant to write too many drafts at the moment because uh, I'm the, doing it all as a whole. Um, the, there is there there okay. There was one draft on F, NFFRR, but it expired, and uh, we um, um, the original. I think there were two, in, in fact, one from oh. Kiriti uh, as a primary author, but that also expired, and then uh, the network action draft. For NFFRR is also expired, uh, so we're trying to reach out. At least me and Loa tried to reach out to the co-authors of the draft and to see what the plans are. Um, depending on the answers, we might need a new draft uh, on this. So this is what uh, the information I have and thought would share it with you. Um, my question is not, uh, I mean, I raised my hand not to answer that, but to ask another question. Uh, so my question is, uh, we, we talked about uh, the uh, NFFRR um, action as a hop-by-hop -hop action. Uh, the scope is hop-by-hop. -hop, and it's a transit node that's uh, turning on the action. Or, yeah, in this case, it's turning on the action. Um, we talked about two options. One is adding a new substack, or the other one was modifying the, possibly modifying an existing substack that has a uh, hop by hop uh, scoped action. Um, I'm not sure what was the conclusion, which approach we want to take uh, a new substack versus modifying the existing one. Um, and maybe that the draft will try to tackle. Uh, or, if we have the answer or document it. <clears throat> and any that's, orthogonal to, that's orthogonal to the, to the existence of this problem, though. Yeah, I agree. But how do we encode it? That's the, yeah. We need, we need it to be sticky. I totally understand. It's just uh, how do we carry it in m &E? OK, thanks. Uh, I'll lower my hand. And okay. Jimmy next. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I, I think uh, 
Stuart raised a valid case uh, in which the proof that the no FR, no for the FR need to be sticky. And uh, actually, I think in there in this case maybe there is a can be a third uh, valid uh, path which is uh, usable, but uh, still the traffic will be loop. Uh, between these two, these nodes, because that path is not preferred comparing to the these two paths, right? So maybe that can also be considered in this case. And I agree, this to be documented as a generic uh, analysis about the FR requirements and uh, in whether how to encode this uh, node for the FR information in different data planes, so maybe. Uh, separate from this uh, description of this case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add that there are, of course, many, many other more complex scenarios that I could draw um, with uh, a triplet in here and it going round and round the uh, the circle, um, or a you know a, 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 a quadrant or a uh, hexagon or whatever. Um, this was just the simplest one um, that. I could just put on one slide and everyone could get their head around it. And indeed, everyone should get their head around it as soon as I did the first slide with just the first failure. Tony. Um, you need to talk to Karidi. He is the only one who can help you. Well, I, I didn't understand that. Uh, that was a bit of a sweeping statement. I think you need a bit more context, Tony. Greedy is the person in charge of the NFFRR draft, period, end of statement, okay? Thank you. Loa. Loa. Uh, Tony, I actually have a mail from Kirieti saying that he is not interested in writing that draft. So Kirieti stepped down and we are on our own. I, I appreciate that, but um, Kriti is also let it be known that no one else may work on NFRR. So you know. Well, no, no one it. else in no one else else inside Juniper may work on it, perhaps, but uh, he doesn't have an embargo on the entire IETF working on the concept. Uh, fair enough. If you want to uh, propose something, go right ahead. Actually, what uh, what Tony uh, what Kirieti said in his mail was actually, please find someone other to do the work. So that's that was this was part of initiating that type of discussion. As far as I know, he has not released his embargo. And I realize he said that to you, but he hasn't said that to anybody else. To be specific, anyone else inside Juniper? Crete can only control what people inside your company do. Okay. All right. I think, uh, yeah, either way, I think we need the draft documenting this, either coming from Kiriti or someone else. And I think uh, it's an important topic to cover. Uh, uh, anything else, Stuart? No, 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 no. I just need to just need to know what I'm, what action I'm going to, um, uh, going to take. Um, yeah. So I, like I mentioned, I tried to reach out. Um, I haven't gotten back any feedback personally. Um, Lowat did try as well. He has some feedback. Um, if we have further feedback, I mean, we'll share it definitely with Stuart, but um, maybe by next week in the chair's meeting, uh, we should have a decision on either a new draft or the existing draft revived. That's, uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, okay. All right. Um, okay. 
that thank you so much for the, uh, yeah. for the presentation thanks okay and i think that was the last item we had i have a couple of action items that i took down uh, from this meeting um and we will follow up on the mailing list. So before we adjourn, uh, let me ask if uh, any uh, any other chair wants to add any, any any closing comments or had anything to say. Mm. No, okay. I think I'm going to give you back uh, the remaining time from today. It was a very good discussion. I hope there will be more clarity on the points uh, on the mailing list. Uh, so keep an eye on the mailing list and uh, see if we can get clarity there. Thank you. Have a good day.